Okay, I'm back. This is Joe Harrison once again. Um, so we'll get our presentation pulled up here. And uh, I would like to indicate that any of you who had downloaded the PowerPoint, uh, my PowerPoint at the very beginning prior to the webcast today, um, we have uploaded a, uh, uh, a more complete version of that. So you may want to uh, download that or be aware to download it after today's webcast. So. Um, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is capturing struvite uh, from dairy manure and trying to, you know, uh, connect us to this whole issue of, uh, of the broken nutrient cycle that we alluded to in our, our very first uh, presentation uh, last month. And um, so... I uh, want to acknowledge that over the last 10 years, as we've worked on the struvite system, we've done it in part partnership with Dr. Keith Bowers and Multiform Harvest. Um, this particular struvite system was originally developed for use for swine. And as uh, Dr. Bowers relocated here to Washington State, we began to work together on adapting the system on over to um, working with uh, with dairy manure, uh, so it does work with both swine and dairy manure. And I'm missing my slide advance button. So could uh, Leslie, could you advance that? Thank you. So in the presentation uh, last month, I indicated that at the federal level, our Economic Research Service had put together this map where they were trying to look at the amounts of uh, phosphorus that were available in manure, and and to match that up with the amount of crops that would use um, phosphorus in, on a county-by-county county basis. And you can see a number of counties here, and um, as, as Dana had mentioned, sprinkled up through that um, Michigan Peninsula area, where we see um, more phosphorus there in the manure than we see in the uh, uh, taken up by the crops. So again, um, this is an issue that's national, and that's why we're trying to address this in such a broad way with this national webcast. Um, the product, so you can get a visual idea of what we're talking about. Um, this looks like sand. Um, and actually, this is struvite that we collected out of the very first system that was put in place at um, a dairy here in Washington. Um, this struvite was produced from fresh dairy manure versus anaerobically digested. Um, so it can be produced from both types of systems, so it doesn't require the anaerobic digester. However, one thing to keep in mind is that um, with attaching a struvite system to the anaerobically digested manure, you're able to capture more total phosphorus. And the reason for that is that the organically bound phosphorus that's there in fresh dairy manure is broken and released into an inorganic form. So more of the total phosphorus is available for extraction or capture when you do treat your uh, manure with an anaerobic digester. The chemical formula or the fertilizer formula for pure struvite from a nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and then magnesium basis would be 629O, uh, and then plus 16, which would be for the magnesium. The, the material is a slow release rate for phosphorus, so this becomes very uh, valuable, um, particularly for situations where um, the material might be used in uh, greenhouse situations for growing potted plants or even a commercial scale. Uh, where we're at uh, a growing uh, agronomically important crops and, and wanting to keep that phosphorus from moving from the landscape into the water. Um, the water solubility is good, uh, but because of this slow release uh, nature, um, we don't have a, a situation where the phosphorus is prone uh, to leaching and, and loss from the, soil, from the soil. The actual struvite formation process um, does require that the phosphorus be in a, a free phosphorus form. Um, and this is one of the challenges we found with dairy manure, was that much of the phosphorus is bound as a calcium phosphorus complex. So we found it necessary to first lower the pH of the manure slightly, and uh, then free up the bonds there between the calcium and, and create that free phosphorus. And once we've got that free phosphorus, we move on to then making sure there's enough magnesium there and we use the uh, ammonia as both a, a source of nitrogen for forming more struvite, but also um, it, it raises the pH at the same time. 
So when we um, make these struvite crystals, we're actually using a bed of crystals to begin with, and then we upflow the manure uh, through those that bed of, of struvite crystals, and you actually uh, build on those crystals um, as, as the process occurs. So with low calcium manure such as swine, in the original work that Dr. Bowers did, uh, the pH reduction step that's shown here wasn't really necessary. So um, dairy being a little bit different from, from swine, we had to, to add this extra step in. The technology is, again, um, um, the chemical uh, formula there, that's a magnesium ammonium phosphate with six uh, waters. Those waters are rather tightly bound to that, but it still appears, as you saw from the very first picture, uh, to be a, a really dry product. Um, I'll, we'll show some more pictures in here in a moment, but the technology is a fluidized bed. That's the engineering term. And this bed is in a cone shape. And the reason for the cone shape is that the struvite crystals are varying sizes. So um, this cone shape allows for a more efficient um, capture of subsequent um, phosphorus and, and making of that struvite versus a, a cylinder type shape. Um, as I mentioned, we lower the pH with an acid. Currently, that's being done with sulfuric. And then we both b uh, do a pH boost with ammonia or caustic soda. And the common method right now is with, uh, with the anhydrous ammonia tank. Um, and then a magnesium boost is done with magnesium chloride. And as I mentioned, um, this system can be used with both anaerobically digested and non-AD or fresh manure uh, systems. This is a picture of um, a full-scale system that's in place currently in Maryland at a dairy there. The, the, the dairy's uh, got about 2,000 lactating cows. What I've done is highlighted here in, um, in the yellow uh, rectangle is one of the two cones um, that, that make up this fluidized bed. You'll notice the uh, yellow uh, up-running uh, arrows, and that's to indicate that that's how the movement of the manures from the bottom of the cone up through the top. Um, so this first tank on the left, the bluish tank, is where pretreatment occurs. So this is where the acidification and the magne magnesium addition occurs. And this is all done at automatically with pH sensors and, and level float sensors in the tank. So as material is drawn and run through this, the cones uh, and you draw material out of the blue tank, then it automatically refills. So it's essentially a, a fairly continuous system. Currently, uh, at this farm, they're treating about 60,000 gallons a day up through these two cones. Capital cost, um, the number that um, I talked to Dr. Bowers on this particular operation would range somewhere in the $75 to $125 range. Operating cost on a per year basis per cow would be somewhere in the $80 to $100. As dairy producers, many think of uh, how much it costs me cap for, per cow per day. And so that's currently in the range of about $15 to $0.20. $0.20. Cents. Um, currently, at this particular facility, when they first installed it during this last year, they were seeing as high as 70% phosphorus recovery. They didn't really want that higher recovery. They didn't need to remove that much phosphorus to get their, their goal for nutrient balance, so they've actually been able to back off a bit on the chemical use and drop it back down to about a 50% uh, recovery of, of, of phosphorus. So there is a lot of flexibility in the system. So if we could, um, let's just show you a, a, a video here of what, uh, so you get a bit of an idea of what this fluidized bed might look like. This is actually a car cartoon type character that came off the web. Um, but you can see as the manure would move up through these struvite crystals, you get this um, swirling and uh, fluidized um, nature of the movement of these particles. So if you can visualize the ammonia coming in there and then you get um, increased uh, production of these uh, struvite crystals. And then once um, you've got the cone where it's fairly full, and you just uh, shut the system down for a short period of time, let the struvite settle out, and then uh, drain the material at the bottom and let it, let it air dry. It's, um, so let's go ahead and um, shut that video off at this point and move back to the slides if we could, thanks. Okay, so um, the previous slide where I showed you the struvite system was on a, a dairy in Maryland. This is actually a picture of a system in a wastewater treatment plant. 
um, in Yakima, which is a central uh, part of our state here in Washington. Um, and they are removing approximately 90% of the phosphorus. And uh, the flow through rate then on this particular system is about 110 gallons per minute. Per cone. Uh, per cone. So we actually have um, you know, systems in place or, or the multi-format systems in place that are in wastewater treatment plants on dairies and have the ability to also treat uh, swine material. Okay, another bit about our research over the last 10 years. Uh, we try to take a broad approach. Uh, we not only wanted to be able to show that we could capture this phosphorus and do it at practical levels and do it on farm, but we also wanted to be able to show and demonstrate the value of this material as a fertilizer. So, you know, as we work on this and, and push this concept of reconnecting the broken cycle, we, we want to be able to move these nutrient sources back to where, where crops are, are grown. So over a course of many studies, we looked at uh, these four crops, triticale, oats, uh, alfalfa, and then corn, which have been corn for, um, for silage production. In some of the very first studies uh, we looked at, this was an agronomic study uh, run with uh, purified potting soils. We looked at triticale, and we did a six-week growth study. Uh, don't be too concerned about the phosphorus uptakes in terms of absolute amounts here on the the uh, y-axis, but the, the main point is to see here that the control only was able to take up about a half a unit. Um, again, that was with no uh, addition of, of any uh, nutrient source, whereas with the struvite, which was S50, S100, and S200, three different levels, we saw this increasing uh, amount of phosphorus uptake by, the, by the, the, the triticale from the struvite. And then when we applied um, commercial fertilizer for the same phosphorus rate, we saw this stair-step approach uh, increase as well, but we're seeing a better uh, uptake by the, uh, uh, from the struvite itself. We then moved that into some greenhouse studies uh, where we took soil that was either low-test uh, Western Washington um, soil, low-test phosphorus, or we had an east side soil from Eastern Washington, and we grew triticale in larger plot, uh, pots in a greenhouse setting. And again, um, here on the right-hand side of this, you'll see that we saw this nice stair-step uh, increase in, in phosphorus uptake by the triticale plant as we go from 1,500 to 200 rate uh, application. Did not tend to see that uh, with the commercial fertilizer. So nice response here. Um, next slide here, we show what it will look like on an east side soil. Um, a soil that's going to be a higher pH, uh, maybe a little harder to see a phosphorus response. Um, but again, it was a low soil test soil. And again, we see the stair-step approach, but um, maybe not the distinct differences that we would have seen on a west side soil. So soil types are going to have a bit of an impact here uh, in terms of responsiveness of, uh, of the struvite, but that's going to be the same case for uh, commercial fertilizers as well. We then moved this up to the final step, which was to take the field scale uh, and plots in fields. This is a slide showing uh, the alfalfa growth on the 1152, which had been the commercial fertilizer, um, on July 11th of 06. Next slide then is what our struvite at the same rate looked like, so you get very comparable growth. Um, this slide, same year, we had companion uh, corn silage plots. This is the commercial 1152.0 at 125 rate. And this slide then shows the struvite at that same rate. So again, pretty comparable. And then this slide shows our check where we actually um, didn't apply any fertilizer and, and the crops um, actually at the end of the growing season looked pretty sad. So um, definite uh, fertilizer response. So some of the frequently asked questions we've had through the years is, well, how much struvite might be produced per cow? About 48 grams per day uh, in a system like this. How much might be produced per 1,000 gallons of manure? That'd be about 2.6 pounds. And then um, economics always come in and play a role. And um, so the system that, you sh that we showed that would have been on the Maryland dairy for the 2,000 cow herd, the price of that for capital um, to put the system in place is somewhere in the neighborhood of about $150,000. We're considering putting one of these at our main campus dairy in Pullman, Washington, because we've got some nutrient management challenges there related to phosphorus. And in talking with Dr. Bowers um, indicated that we'd probably be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of about $60,000 for a 200 cow herd. 